I am going to talk today about making three technologies that were never intended to work together, to actually work together. The Nest thermostat is a modern version of uh, technology from the 1800s. A pellet stove is a version of a campfire that doesn't burn the house down, it burns efficiently. And a yurt is, or the modern version of a yurt, is just a tent built on an angel Mongolian design. Last Christmas, a friend of mine gave me one of these things. There was only one problem. <laughs> I live here, and I heat with fire. So how do you make these things work together? What am I going to do with this, this gift that was, what, $350 or something like that? It's a ridiculous price for a business hat. Well, first, a little bit of history, and I'll tell you who I am. I have lived in a yurt now for 20 years. I've been heating with a pellet stove. The first pellet stoves I ever got were entirely manual things. I lit it with a blowtorch, uh, and it had on and off, and then all of these dials to, to um, throttle the number of pellets that get poured into the crucible. If you don't know what a pellet stove is, use these little waste pellets, uh, waste wood, compressed into little pellets that are fed into a crucible. And uh, it uses the, uh, the blast furnace idea, blowing air through the crucible, so you get a very hot fire, very fuel efficient. Um, there is no more fuel efficient way of burning wood. It's the most efficient way possible. Uh, my first pellet, like I said, my first pellet stove was, was pretty primitive, as was my first yurt. Oh, by the way, I'm Lars. Uh, I work for Mozilla. Uh, I am the Mozilla uh, Web Engineering Herd Patriarch. And in view of being the Herd Patriarch, <laughs> oh, well, well, they cost 83 cents to 3D print. <laughs> I'll just take this uncomfortable thing off. <laughs> Break the mic off first. Okay, I might have drop that. But like I said, I'll just print another one. <laughs> All right. Um, my first yurt, uh, I wrote about it on, on the web in 1995. That website is still there, basically unchanged in all of these years. Uh, it documents how I built the yurt from the kit from Pacific Yurts. Um, I encourage you to go there. In fact, you can just go down Google, type yurt and Lars, and look at my page. Like I said, they like pages that have been around for that, that long. This is what my modern yurt looks like. Uh, it's not much of a, much like a, just a primitive tent. I'm not responsible for the interior decorating. If I hadn't done it, it would have been animal skins and hardly parts. Uh, but I also wanted to put this picture in because I noticed a lot of people are putting pictures of their cats in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get my cat in the presentation. So anyway, I want to take this Nest thermostat and make it work with the earth. My current thermostat, or my current uh, pellet stove, is just a little bit less primitive than the previous one. It already can work with a thermostat, just turning it on and off, so it lights itself. I don't have to use a blowtorch. Uh, but there's this one little problem. It's got this switch on the back with high, medium, and low. Thermostat doesn't understand how to do high, medium, and low. It just turns things on and off. It's very binary. Uh, and if you want to run a pellet stove efficiently, you need to adjust the, the feed of, of how fast the pellets go in. If they go in too fast and it's uh, warm outside, you overheat the room, and you develop in the crucible what are called clinkers. Uh, these welded together pieces of ash. They're very annoying. You have to chisel them out. And if you can run the pellet stove properly, going from high to medium low is appropriate, you can avoid the clinkers and run even more efficiently. Well, I started doing some research, and I discovered that the Nest thermostat can actually do high, medium, and low. I just have to find a way to take that switch and automate it. So what I'm going to talk to you today is some uh, applying some digital electronics, some techniques from, from digital electronics, 
with mechanical systems. First thing I'm going to do is introduce some concepts here. SPDT. Anyone know what that means? Single pole double throw. Exactly. Single pole double throw. That is the definition of a switch. Single pole double throw. Here's a switch. We have the single pole power coming into the top of the switch, and then we can change the switch to double throw, one, one direction or the other. So mouse comes in, we click it, the other light comes on. Now the switch that I had in the previous, it had three levels. This one's switch two. That switch is actually uh, called a single pole double throw center off. So when, imagine this little line there being exactly in the center, so neither light is on. That's the three states. It happens to, uh, on the pellet stove, uh, set that up so that low is one, medium is both of them off, and high is the other. So behind that switch, there are three wires. Yellow, which is the pole, the thing that comes in, brings the power in. And then there's the orange wire and the blue wire. The blue wire is for low, and the orange wire is for high. I can show that by getting a voltmeter, and figuring it out high, medium, and low. I look at how many volts. Uh, thermostats run on 24 volts AC. Uh, and so I can see that when it's on high, the orange wire has 24 volts. And when it's on medium, they're both turned off. And when it's on low, the blue wire is 24 volts. If I think about the thermostat wire coming in for on and off and add that to this list here, when the thermostat wire is 24 volts, it means that the pellet stove is on, this is the pellet stove off, those voltages still apply whether the thermostat has turned the pellet stove on or off. So we have three wires there and six states. If I turn this into a logic diagram and just take uh, the 24 volts and call them ones and the zero volts and call them zeros, and then take those, those you know, three binary inputs, three, uh, two to the third power, we end up with eight possibilities. So that's what these two blind spots here. I'm going to just add them in here, put the numbers in, and call these X. Just don't care. They're, they're invalid states, but you'll see later they're, they're important to have in this chart. So let's go over a look at the nest thermostat. We see what the inputs are to the, the pellet stove. Let's look at the outputs are from the thermostat. Most thermostats just symbol on off. The uh, nest is more sophisticated. It can do high, medium, and low. It does so with three wires. Unfortunately, they're all white. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's a little awkward. So I'm calling the white wire one, two, and three. So when the pellet stove is off, all three of those wires are at zero. Uh, when it's at low, the first one is at one. When it's at medium, the second one's at one, and when it's high, the third one's at one. Or at least that's what I guessed, because there's no documentation about it uh, in the Nest documentation, or anywhere on the web I could find anywhere. There's another possibility. It could work like this, where low is the first wire, medium is the next two wires, and high is all three wires. I'm not sure which it was, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do both. I'm going to make this thing respond to either system. Uh, and again, here we have three inputs and only six states. I'm going to take those missing states and put them in and just call them X, don't care, be legal. All right, so here is the logic table for what I want to do. When the three input wires from the thermostat are all zero, I want those values in the pellet stove. When the, the uh, nest thermostat says low, just that one wire, I want the white wire to have high voltage, turn the pellet stove on, and I want the blue wire to have voltage, that's on low. Then medium is going to be when either of these two states from the uh, uh, nest, and I want the orange and blue wire to be off, but the white wire to the pellet stove on. And uh, the X's down there are those illegal states. These are all the illegal states. You'll find they're useful in a few minutes. So now how do I make the circuitry to implement this table? So let's look at just making circuitry to run the white wire. 
These are the inputs. That's the white wire output. I'm going to rearrange this information. Actually, first, let's just say that uh, I did this naively as a programmer could do it, and go through it. Each one of those rows is a different if statement, saying if this condition, then make the pellet stove do that. If that condition, make the pellet stove do that. I could reduce that to a Boolean expression, like that, with a little uh, not character being the, the hyphen with a little descender on it, because I couldn't figure out how in HTML to put it over R for not. So anyway, that represents each of the possible states of those wires. And it, um, these dots means and, the plus means or. So it's the or of any of these possible states. Now I could do some Boolean algebra on that to minimize it. But I don't want to do Boolean algebra, but Boolean algebra is hard. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a trick that I learned in electrical engineering back in 1979 that lets you not use Boolean algebra, but get a, uh, an optimized equation nevertheless. It's called a Carnot map. I am completely flummoxed that computer scientists do not know about Carnot maps, because they're amazingly efficient at reducing complex Boolean expressions down to a minimal number of terms. Essentially what I've done is I've taken the inputs and arranged them around the side of this matrix. This is the white wire one, it's two possible values, zero and one. And along the columns I have uh, the, the white wire two and white wire three. I've just highlighted white wire two so you can see the values there. You notice something odd. Zero, 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 one, 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 zero, one. I didn't put those in sorted order. I put them in an order which is called a gray code. Between any two columns, as I move from column to column, only one bit changes from column to column. That allows me to do some very clever things. Let's fill in the inputs, or the, the outputs, into the section. We'll start with this uh, uh, red one here. That's when all the white wires are zero. Going back to that previous thing, that's that zero state there. Bring in that zero, bring in the rest of the values, those X's were those illegal states. Now to do a Carnot map, what you do is you highlight or circle sets of ones, or ones and X's, where the number of ones of contiguous sets are a power of two. So I can circle either one item, two items, four items, or eight items. Can't do six. So what is a, a first thing here I can do that's a power of two? That's, that's a power of two, four items. I can't take those last two ones over there in that column because that would be six items total in that block. Uh, another block, this purple one here. We overlap the previous block, that's okay, it doesn't matter. And there's finally a third block right there. That covers all of the ones. As soon as you've covered all of the ones in the table, then you're able to make an equation out of it by doing this. In the button, it doesn't take you there. All right, so we're going to examine each of the inputs and write down which of the inputs are relevant to the equation. If the value of the input changes across the, the range that we've highlighted, it is irrelevant and it does not participate in this equation. If it does not change, remains constant across the uh, uh, range highlighted there that it is relevant and should be written down as part of the equation. So, let's examine white wire one. Does white wire one change value across the red region? Yes, it does. It's got a zero and a one. It's irrelevant. We'll cross it out. Okay, let's look at white wire two. Does it change value across the range? Here in yellow. What's a zero, what's a one? You're supposed to say yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, it's irrelevant, it has nothing to do with this equation. Uh, we cross it out. Wire three, looks good. It's got one, it's constant across that range, which means it is part of the equation. And now we can move on to our next region. Well, actually, I, I wanted to do a proof here first. Uh, this is if I were to naively do this, this is the equation that would cover that, that region. I can do go ahead and do the Boolean algebra here, because really I don't need Boolean algebra, I like it. 
<laughs> I can do it here, and we can prove. I won't go through these steps exactly. I'm not here to teach women algebra. But it actually really does boil all the way down. It's just W3. So let's go on and do the next region. What remains constant in that region and what does not? Wire 2. Exactly. White wire 2. Everything else changes, so we know white wire 2 is part of this equation. This last one. What is constant and what is not? Wire 1 is constant. Wire 2 is also constant here, but its value is 0. That translates into this. I'm sorry, I'm black. I got ahead of myself. I'm looking at, thinking about the wrong slide. I'm sorry, uh, they, you were correct. Wire 2 was not constant. The only constant was wire 1. So for the white wire, the output is just the OR of the three uh, other input wires. That translates to the original Boolean expression of all the values, just boils down to that, and comes up as this circuit. Think of these switches as three white wire inputs. These lights down here, these LEDs, are the uh, just showing us what the, what the value is. So I turn on switch one, we're at level one, the white wire turns the telescope on. We go on and turn on wire number two, and we're still, the pellet stove is still on. This is just basically implementing a three input OR gate. Very simple. I won't look, go to the whole animation here because it's pretty obvious. All right, now let's examine the orange wire. We're going to do the same Carnot map idea. What's constant? Wire three. Nothing else is constant. The orange wire is equal to wire 3. Just move on, I'm going to do an animation that's just simple. Now here's the one that I was saying, I heard for a moment. All right, what do we circle here in the blue wire? The only thing we have available is that, the 1 and the x. Because we can't get that other x in because it's not contiguous. So here, white wire 1 is constant, and white wire 2 is constant, but its value is 0. And so that corresponds to the blue wires. The equation is the white wire and not the white wire too. I keep saying the white wire. I wish I hadn't made all the, all the wires the same color. <laughs> it's really obnoxious. So that translates into this circuit. Again, we have our three switches for input. And this just indicates what our input is. We have an AND gate and an inverter. We put on level one. The blue wire goes to 24 volts. The second wire comes, or the second wire gets turned on, and then the white wire, the blue wire goes off. We're still at level two, and really, switch three has no bearing whatsoever on this equation. If you follow the line, it just goes and lights the little indicator, <laughs> nothing else, and. Uh, this will show that it still works properly if you just do that other technique of each wire individually instead of the cumulative. So here's our final equation for the, the adapter. And the final circuit diagram. Uh, again, same three wires input. Indicators are three wires output. This is the white wire of the thermostat, or the white wire of the pellet stove, the orange wire, the blue wire. At level one, the blue is on and the white is on. At level two, level two, <laughs> at level two, thank you, uh, the white wire is on. Remember the switch center off, they're both turned off. And finally, when number three comes on, the orange wire goes to 24 volts. So we have our circuit diagram for, for logic here. But the question is, how in the world do you implement logic gates in 24 volts AC current? I mean, that's not TTL logic, it's not anything. Well, the clue is to go back to 1955. This is a picture of the back end of a pinball machine from 1955. And this is, by the way, a joke. This is probably the earliest version of Flash I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you look at these switches, you see 
single pole switches. These long ones are the pole, and the short ones are the contacts. You can see as you move the switch, they would open the break. Here's a, a double throw switch right there. So maybe this will give you a clue on how you can implement a logic gate. See how those things open and close the switches? So if you want to do a logic gate, you would have your input line control the electromagnet, and your output lines are done by switches. How do you do an AND and OR gate in a switch? Well, it's really very simple. On the left, we have two switches in series. When one switch is on, nothing happens. When both switches are on, the light comes on. Close, or open any switch, the light goes out. And the gate is that. It's an AND gate. Imagine those switches being controlled by, a, by a, an electromagnetic relay. Over here, we have two switches in parallel. Either one of them will turn the light on. If they're both turned on, the light's on. That's an OR gate. So armed with that knowledge and the logic diagram that we had before, we can come up with the final schematic for controlling the pellet stove from the Nest thermostat. Coming in from the top, we have our three white wires from the uh, pellet stove. Each one of those things, if you follow the dotted line, controls a relay. Uh, when the electromagnet is activated, this plunger pulls closer to the magnet, which changes the value of the switch. This black line is the white wire that turns the pellet stove on and off, and you'll see it goes to every single switch, every single relay. And if you look at them, that is three switches in parallel. It's a three input OR gate. Let's look at the blue wire. Follow the yellow wire up here, go hits a switch, follow the blue wire around, it's another switch, but notice it's an inverted state from the previous switch, and back around. That is an AND gate. And then following the orange wire, it's just a simple switch, which is called a buffer uh, in electrical engineering. So here we have the whole logic diagram in uh, as a schematic for uh, electromechanical relays. So what's the next step? Uh, next step is to bring my screen back. There we go. The next step is <laughs> avoid the warranty of the pellet stove. Open it up by going in and starting cutting wires. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut that yellow wire and route it out of the pellet stove into my little device. Uh, I'm going to splice the orange wire and send it out, and the blue wire, and then I'm going to take the, that set of wires and route them out to a box. This is that box. When I first built this project, uh, I hadn't anticipated that I was going to make presentations or blog postings about it at all. It was just something I was doing. Uh, so I did take a lot of photographs. But if you look here and how I've implemented it, these sockets will accept relays. That's what a modern relay looks like uh, instead of those uh, open contact things from the pinball machine from the 50s. Anyway, if you look at these wires and trace them through, you'll see that I have faithfully reproduced that schematic. Uh, Connect it all up, connect all the white wires uh, at the bottom end. You see the three white wires from the thermostat coming in. The orange wire, the yellow wire, blue wires, and orange, the yellow wires go out. Blue wire, the orange wire, and the white wire head out the top going to the pellet stove. Turn it all on, and lo and behold, the, the thermostat turns the pellet stove on to level one. Pellet stove lights. And after 10 minutes, it's not warm enough in the yurt, so the Nest thermostat says, go to level two. Click, we're on level two. Finally, after 20 minutes, it's not warm enough, click to level three. I call it triumph. Shakes <laughs> out. Oh, another cat picture. Yeah. Happy in front of the fire. <laughs> so how well does this, this, this perform? Well, Nest says that it will take at least two weeks for your thermostat to learn your home and your habits. Uh, the first week, 
of running the pellet stove in the in the yurt was hell. <laughs> it's as if you had taken a two-year-old and let them control the food staff. <laughs> It was hot, it was cold. We never knew what to expect when we walked in there. Um, the yurt is a volatile temperature environment. Uh, if it doesn't get heat, it, it's just a tent. It loses heat very quickly and it's hard to build it back up again. And so it was not a fun week. In the second week, it got better. Um, it was more predictable. We knew when the pellet stove was gonna be on, but it was always cold in there. And then finally, in the third week, the nest rocked in fullness. And all of a sudden, uh, everything was just fine. It would work reasonably well. So, do I like it? Yes, I do. But, you know, if I were to sit there and, as a full-time job of running that high-low switch, I could do better than the nest thermostat does. So, that's a negative. It's not as good as I can do it. But a positive, I'm not doing it. That's, it's automated. That's what I wanted. And even better, <laughs> it's better than anyone else in the household runs the third, run, can run that high, low, medium, low switch. So what else about it? Um, I think the pellet stove, the nest turns the pellet stove off too abruptly. When it reaches the target temperature, it just it turns it off. And all of a sudden, the, the temperature in the yurt goes into free fall. Uh, and uh, it drops, can drop rapidly, depending on what the outdoor temperature is. Uh, and when the, when the nest says, oh, it's, it's cold here again, I'm going to turn it on level one, and then wait 10 minutes to see if it got warm enough. That doesn't work. Uh, at level one, if it's really cold, this last one goes really bad, uh, it can, the temperature can still continue to drop while it's at level one. So that's not a good thing. But I'm not running it manually. So that's a good thing. I'm going to keep saying that. And just from looking at it, from what I can tell, our pellet usage is down. It, it uh, doesn't use as much fuel, which is one of the features that the nest says they're going to do. Now, I don't have hard numbers on that. I just have the, the feeling that you know we're not filling that thing as frequently as we used to could be outdoor temperatures. So how could it be better? Um, I would like it to advance through the stages faster. Instead of taking 10 minutes before deciding to go to level two, do it in five minutes. Nest does not offer that, that possibility. So I'm not sure how to solve that particular problem. I'd also like to have a phased shutdown. Instead of just cutting off the pellet stove at the end, I'd love to have it back down slowly <coughs> through, through the uh, uh, through the levels. Uh, go down, if it's at level three and we reach the temperature, uh, the nest says turn off. Instead of turning off, it goes down to level two and sits there for five minutes. If uh, the pellet stove hasn't, or rather the nest thermostat hasn't called for more heat at that point, drop it down to another level. If it has called for more heat, go ahead and up it again. So what would the logic diagram for that kind of behavior look like? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it goes on. <laughs> so really, what we have here is I press my throat against the mic. We have seven inputs. Previously, we had only three inputs. And we have now an additional output called the trigger. What we have is the, the output is part of the next level input. Uh, and that's a loop. And when you implement that kind of thing uh, in visual logic, you use what is called a flip-flop, which is the basic unit of computer memory. Uh, so, what I propose, perhaps, is another talk next year, implementing this using TTL logic and ICs. So instead of technology from the 50s, I'll advance to the 70s. <laughs> <laughs>
So that's my presentation. This entire thing was done in Firefox using HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. The, uh, uh, the circuit animations were done using uh, an app called Every Circuit running on Android. Uh, but I trying to do this video screen captures of those was kind of a presentation all of its own. Uh, I had to download Android for Intel, get it running on a VM virtual machine under Linux, and using record my desktop to to get the uh, to get the, the um, get those videos. So that's it. My presentation can be seen. These slides are available on my website at that lovely URL that's so easy to memorize. <laughs> Actually, that's the original uh, um, blog posting that I did for this. Any questions about this? Carno apps. Yes? Did your friend not know you well enough to, to, to give you an S thermostat for your yurt? Um, Is it a joke? I, he works for Nest. Uh, <laughs> and I think he was challenging me to do this. <laughs> he knows you, yeah. Yes, he knows me. <laughs> Yeah. Um, could it make better predictions if it were taking an outside temperature as an input as well? The Nest thermostat, I think it could. Um, uh, and in fact, I wonder if it actually does because they are internet enabled, and it may actually go out and you know query a website to find out what the outdoor temperature is. It knows where it is. Okay. It knows who <laughs> Which is kind of scary, um, but it does. It clearly doesn't understand an extremely volatile temperature environment like the dirt. Uh, it would advance faster. It's supposed to learn how long it takes to uh, 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 turn on or to heat the space, uh, so that it. Let's say you set it. You want it to turn on. You want your your space to be warm at 8 a.m. And it will figure out that first two week period that it takes. 30 minutes to get it up to temperatures, so it will know to start 30 minutes early. Well, it apparently doesn't know to start as early as it needs to to do it in the yurt. Uh, it may have to start an hour earlier. It just doesn't seem to be able to understand that. Yeah. Have you been able to talk with your friend that actually works there to get support and have a? Um, he actually he actually uh, opened a, a, a ticket in their bug tracking system uh, to put yurt. In as a setup option. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, the on that. unfortunately <laughs> it, 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 you know, it got voted down. <laughs> um, after I initially uh, did my blog posting about this, I was contacted by people at Nest. Oh, I was contacted by people at the pellet stove company too. Oh, really? Who said we had no idea you could do this? Andrew warranty is for you. It was actually already as an older pellet stove. The practical question: um, How did you tag the three white wires coming out of the nest so you didn't want to poke your eyes out with sharp pencils? Um, I just took a. Did you, you know, take a sharpie and write on it? Uh, a label maker uh, you know, and write right. a little tag for each of the ones: white one, white two, white three. That lets you get down here. Straight. Yeah. And then does your pellet stove feed gravitationally the auger at the bottom? Yes, yes, gravitational auger at the bottom. And then you refill it periodically? Uh, depending on how, how what the outdoor temperature is, and how cold it is in the year. The coldest temperatures, we generally refill it once a day. Mm -hmm. uh, this time of year, uh, it actually is running this time of year because it gets cooler at night, although we'll turn it off soon. Uh, uh, a bag of pellets will last us a uh, week and a half. So the next step to get the nest kind of keep track of things so it can move the automatic shuttle over and dump it in. It would be nice to do to that, but unfortunately, uh, my yurt is not near anything that which you know, we have to carry these bags of pellets uh, quite a ways. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to mention, yeah, Nest did put out a, like a developer API now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, that, that might help with your step down, possibly. Um, I, I had just I think, read in the last 24 hours that they had a developer API. Yeah. I was going to look into it and see, see if I could use that to, to assist. Mm -hmm. Although, honestly, I really want to implement that. Uh, the 28 diagram. I want to do that all in uh, <laughs> TTL logic. 
Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Go out.